This is the perfect home server for me. It has the latest Ryzen 7 processor with eight cores and 16 threads, 96 gigs of DDR5 memory, dual 10 gig NICs, room for tons of two and a half inch SSDs, two NVMe slots on the motherboard itself, but technically you can fit like six due to PCIe bifurcation. It's super power efficient and so power efficient that the power supply has a fan that doesn't even have to run. It's incredibly quiet and it all fits in a short depth micro ATX 2U case. If you buy all of the parts at the right time when they're on sale, you can build this for around a thousand US dollars and it is a virtualization powerhouse. If you don't want to spend that much, there are so many areas that you can cut costs, but we'll talk about that later. All parts for this build will be listed in the description. The first area we had to tackle was selecting the right CPU. Since this is all designed to fit in a micro ATX 2U case, we had to go with a powerful but power efficient processor, and that's how I settled on the Ryzen 7 9700X. Gamers hate this thing, but for home labs, it's pretty perfect. It has eight cores and 16 threads, supports DDR5 ECC memory if you want it, has a 65 watt TDP, making it super power efficient, but also easy to cool. And it was just on sale for $230. So it's reasonably priced if you're patient. You can go with a processor that has more cores and more threads, but truthfully, I don't think you need it. From an official support standpoint, the max memory speed you can use with Ryzen 9000 processors is 5,600 mega transfers per second with two DIMMs. So while we can upgrade to four DIMMs in the future, we're killing the performance of the memory. This means that we're most likely gonna run out of memory before we run out of processing power. So I wanted to maximize the overall performance without overclocking anything, which personally, I don't think should be done on a home server where reliability is important, but I digress. For this reason, I settled on 96 gigs of DDR5 G-Skill Flare X5 memory. It's non-ECC, but it runs at the 56 mega transfers per second that we were looking for. And while this is the first home server I've built that won't have ECC memory, DDR5 ECC memory is so expensive that I can't justify the costs. I'm not running anything super important on this, so while I'd love the ECC memory, it's not totally necessary, and the 96 gigs of RAM is the perfect total for an eight core 16 thread processor. Now that we have our processor and memory, it was time to select a motherboard. I had two main requirements outside of a micro ATX form factor. Support ECC memory in case I ever wanna run it in the future, and PCIe bifurcation, which will allow me to split the PCIe lanes if needed. I settled on the ASRock B650M Pro RS. This thing is pretty bare bones and doesn't even have Wi-Fi, which is awesome because who needs it for a home server? It has one Gen 5 and one Gen 4 NVMe slot, supports the PCIe bifurcation that I brought up earlier and is relatively cheap and it just works. It has features like power on after power loss, which is nice for a home server. And overall, I'm very happy with the selection. With all of that settled, I had to find a way to power it, and I went with a Corsair RM750X. It was on sale for $80 when I bought it, but it's way overkill from a wattage perspective. However, it had the zero fan mode that I was looking for. When you turn it on, the fan spins up for about 10 seconds and then turns off and stays off. The issue with 2U cases is you generally need to find a case that has a vent for a power supply. And due to the nature of rack mount devices being stacked on top of each other, I couldn't guarantee that the power supply will have a way to vent. So outside of going with a three or four U case, finding a unicorn power supply that vents out the back or using a non ATX power supply, I think, think that this is the best solution. I'm using such a small amount of power in comparison to what this device is capable of that this fan should never turn on. And running it at full load through benchmarks, it never did, so I'm very happy with this power supply and I think it will be exactly what I need. For storage, I have two two and a half inch SSDs for the operating system and one NVMe drive for virtual machines, which is plenty fast for the 10 gig network adapter that I'm using. The biggest challenge, quite honestly, was the case. I ended up going with a Silverstone RM23502 Mini. It's expensive, comes with no fans, and is basically a standard micro ATX 2U case. The drive cage blocks one of the two 80 millimeter fans. There's no exhaust, and overall the airflow isn't that good. It's compact, premium, and it couldn't possibly be easier to build in. 
But from a performance perspective, I'm not sure it's worth the money over a cheaper to you case. There aren't that many options in this category and the ones that exist generally have their own problems. But overall, love the look, love building in it, it's premium, but the cooling isn't the best. And the cable management, that is probably on me. Fortunately, temperatures are fine, but that has more to do with the components selected rather than the case. After finishing the build, it was time to turn it on and that's when the fun really started. I turned it on and nothing wouldn't boot. After a few minutes, I realized that since this is a new processor, there's a pretty good chance the motherboard's BIOS version didn't support it out of the box, which ended up being a pretty easy thing to fix. ASRock allows you to update the BIOS without even turning the device on. So I followed their flashback instructions and the BIOS was updated. Unfortunately, still didn't boot. So after about 15 minutes of trying, I removed one of the RAM sticks and it booted. After about two minutes, which ended up being the clue that I needed. The problem is it would only boot with one DIMM filled and it couldn't be the B2 DIMM slot, which funny enough is what ASRock recommends that you use with one memory module. After testing both memory modules, I thought I had a bad motherboard, which is the worst news you can get at this time. But buried in the internet somewhere, I found someone that suggested changing the memory training settings in the BIOS to auto. I did that, booted it up with one memory module, confirmed it worked, then booted it up with the second and voila, we were good. So yeah, if you've heard DDR5 training is a pain, I can confirm that is true. I ran Memtest 86 on it two or three times to ensure there were no memory errors. In my opinion, this is the first thing you should do with any build. So if there are any errors, return the memory. After that, I installed Windows 10 to update the firmware on the SSDs, as well as to run Cinebench to make sure everything was good. But more importantly, monitor the temperature of the CPU and make sure it was decent. It idled around 40 degrees Celsius and maxed out around 85 degrees but I wanted to see if I could get it to run a little cooler. So in the BIOS, I changed both chassis fans and the CPU fan to use performance mode. This ramps up the fans faster, which didn't help with the temperatures that much, but did allow for better overall performance in Cinebench. I might play with the fan curves a little, but this processor won't be even close to 100% CPU usage like it was with the benchmark. So I'm not that worried about the temperatures and it's in a 2U case with minimal cooling. So what did I expect? After this, it was time to install Proxmox on it, which is what I'll be using as my hypervisor. And the Proxmox setup I'll be using will be in a different video, so get subscribed if you want to see that. That was the build though, and overall, I'm pretty damn happy with it. To recap this with pricing, it's not a budget build, but it's also not that expensive for the performance that you're getting. I paid a little over 1,000 US dollars for everything, excluding storage, but I'm not including that because Storage is wildly different depending on what you need. That's expensive, but I didn't really wait for any sales. And if I did, it would have been in the low $900 range. The thing is you can very easily turn this into a more budget build, even if you bought everything at full price. The case was very expensive and didn't have fans. So we can replace it with a Rosewell case for 80 bucks that comes with two fans. The Intel 10 gig card I bought has two SFP plus ports on it. If you only want one, you can pick one up for under 35 bucks. The next thing would be memory. If you don't need 96 gigs, go with 64 gigs because it's a lot cheaper. And then a 9600X processor or even a 7600 from last generation will cut costs even more. Depending on exactly what you change, you can save anywhere from one to $400 or so, which is much more budget friendly while still maintaining a ton of performance. That's still expensive and I don't wanna make it sound like it's not, but you're also building a server with some of the latest parts you can get. And I'm not sure you'd be able to build something as powerful, quiet and power efficient for that much less. And that power efficiency is no joke. It's been running around 55 to 65 watts or so with all of my VMs, which is easily 30 to 40 watts less than my old server was running at. So to say that I'm happy is an understatement. It's not the best server. And if I had to do it all over again, I'd probably use a different case because I'm not sure that it's worth the premium. But honestly, I don't think I'd change anything else. Let me know down in the comments what you think of this build. Would you change anything? Should I have gone with that Ryzen 7900 processor which is probably the perfect home lab processor. Should I have attempted to get a 9900X to run at 65 watts? 
These are the questions that I've asked myself for weeks, but get subscribed if you want to see where this build ends up. Thank you for watching. I'll see you guys next time.